Our first speaker is Dr. Michelle Cavagelli. Dr. Cavagelli is a soil scientist at USDA ARS in Beltsville, Maryland. He is lead scientist of the Farming Systems Project, which is a long-term cropping project evaluating the sustainability of organic and conventional methods. He also conducts research to improve nutrient management in diverse cropping systems, and he serves as co-lead of the USDA Northeast Climate Hub. He earned a PhD in crop and soil science at Michigan State University, a master's of science in soil science from Kansas State University, and a BA in biology from Oberlin College. Today, he will be presenting his presentation titled, The Impact of Grain Farming on Climate Change. Welcome, Dr. Cavigelli. I'll turn the screen over to you. Okay, thanks, Anastasia. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from sunny Beltsville, Maryland. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you, as the slide indicates, about the impact of grain farming on climate change. It's going to be a fairly general uh, concept talk, and then I'm going to use a case study from our long-term ag research here in Beltsville to illustrate the concept that I'm first going to uh, dis discuss. And uh, the first thing I want to do is <clears throat> provide you a quick outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about global warming and greenhouse gases and the connection between the two. I'm going to talk about the agricultural impacts on greenhouse gases and I'm going to talk about global warming potential and what that is and how to measure it and how we have measured it in our long-term study to, to uh, highlight then number four, the impact of diverse cropping systems on global warming potential. Um, I'm going to grab a pointer here that I'll try to use periodically I need to. Otherwise, it might stay up in the top left corner there. You can ignore it unless I try to use it. Uh, first of all, uh, as many of you may have seen these types of data, this is from the IPCC showing the impact of global warming on various important uh, parameters, the top one showing the global average surface temperature in degrees Celsius. You can see from about 19, um, uh, 1930s, 40s, into the 50s until the present, uh, we've had increasing surface temperatures. You can see we've had an average uh, sea level rise and snow cover in the northern hemisphere has gone down. So those are just some of the impacts of climate change or global warming, which are somewhat synonymous. Um, what's the cause of all this? The cause of all this is that there are at least three biogenic greenhouse gases that are increasing in the concentration in the atmosphere. This is again data from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, showing the, con the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide here in parts per million over a 10,000 year time period showing the last about uh, 200 years, I guess, here, uh, showing a sm strong increase in CO2. Ditto for methane, which is also a greenhouse gas, also produced by biological organisms, therefore called biogenic. Nitrous oxide is the third important greenhouse gas and shows the same pattern. Okay, so these three gases have different global warming potentials. In other words, they, they absorb, each molecule absorbs a different amount of uh, solar radiation that's bounced back from the surface of the planet Earth, and they have such, such a big difference that one gram of N2O is equivalent to 298 grams of CO2. So what we then can do is we can, we can uh, convert all three gases to the same unit, and that unit is called CO2 equivalence. So one N2O molecule time, or one, uh, one gram of N2O, one, uh, one unit of mass of N2O then, sorry, I need to grab my pointer, one unit of N2O is equivalent to 298 molecules of CO2. Methane is also more powerful than CO2. It's 25 times more powerful than CO2, and so its CO2 equivalent is, uh, one molecule has a CO2 equivalent of 25. Hopefully that, that made sense. Uh, 
So where do these uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases come from? If you look at the graph on the left here, you'll see that all three gases have been increasing since 1970. If you look on the uh, axis here, CO2 from fossil fuel use and other sources is the largest source of these greenhouse gases. Also CO2 from deforestation, decay in peat, so that's decom decomposition of the peat. Methane from agriculture, waste, and energy is also important. And then finally, N2O from agriculture and other gases is the third major source of these atmospheric greenhouse gases. There's also some fluorine gases. You can see from these graphs that that's a pretty small contribution, so I won't be talking about that. If you look then at uh, this figure here, B, you can see that about 57% of the gases in the atmosphere are from CO2 fossil fuel use, 17% from deforestation, of, again CO2, and then methane is about 14% and N2O about 8% of the overall uh, global warming potential. So this is again, all these units have been converted, all these gases have been converted into CO2 equivalents. If you look down at this uh, graph down here, number C, number C or letter C, <laughs> Um, this breaks down the sources of these greenhouse gases by, by uh, industrial sectors. So we have energy supply, 26%, transport, 13%. Come over here, you see agriculture is at 13.5%, and forestry, which is sometimes combined with agriculture, at 17.4%. And different people or different organizations do this accounting slightly different so that in agriculture, often some aspects of um, greenhouse gases are not incorporated because they actually end up in the energy supply. So energy use on farm is usually in this energy box. Transport of uh, products to the farm ends up in the transport box. And production of nitrogen fertilizers might end up in this industry box over here. So this agriculture 13.5 uh, needs to be t uh, recognized that there are these other portions of the of uh, of a global industry that contribute to agriculture indirectly, and these numbers are all on a global basis. FYI, if we look then at more specifically, again on a global basis, the contribution of the three biogenic gases, CO2, methane, and N2O as uh, what portion agriculture contributes to each of these gases, you'll see that CO2, that agriculture is not an important source of CO2, essentially because most of the CO2 is, uh, is currently from um, <clears throat> fossil fuel emissions and deforestation. This, this number does not include deforestation. But you'll see that agriculture is a very important source of methane and N2O. 50 to 60 percent for those two. And these contributions are also increasing. Agricultural methane and N2O increased 17 percent from 1990 to 2005. So what's unique about agriculture though is that agriculture actually has the potential to reduce greenhouse gases and to mitigate or, re or reduce emissions from other sources. And agriculture can do this using existing technologies that can be implemented immediately and that are being implemented. For example, reducing tillage, in increasing carbon inputs to soil, both of those can increase the soil carbon. Any carbon in the soil at some point was CO2 in the atmosphere that got transferred to the soil via photosynthesis. N2O emissions can be reduced by improving nitrogen fertilizer use efficiency, and both methane and N2O can be reduced by improving livestock management. So these are all practices that are currently used in agriculture and that could provide additional conservation benefits in addition to greenhouse gas mitigation. This is an estimate of what mitigation is possible. This again is on a global basis from IPCC showing what practices down here on the x-axis uh, 
might contribute to mitigation of these three gases. And you see that the bulk of mitigation potential really is for CO2. And this is largely, if not completely, increasing carbon in the soil through the various practices that I showed on the previous slide, along with other practices. Methane can be reduced. That's largely an issue of rice management. In the U.S., we really don't have that much rice, so this bar would be a lot smaller. But we do have a fair amount of livestock, so this is really the primary area where methane mitigation could occur in the U.S. There's also some manure management that could reduce uh, methane emissions. And you'll see that N2O is important at some level, but a smaller contribution here. Basically what this is saying is that it's harder to mitigate N2O emissions than it is to mitigate CO2 emissions. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to introduce this concept of global warming potential. And global warming potential is essentially the balance between the net exchange of these three biogenic greenhouse gases, CO2, N2O, and methane, that results from on-farm practices in the production and transport of inputs. So global warming potential, GWP, could be greater than zero within agriculture. And what that means is that that agricultural activity or set of agricultural practices contributes to global climate change or to global warming. If global warming potential is less than zero, that says that that activity or combination of activities reduces or mitigates global climate change. And of course, uh, GWP could be near zero for a given, given uh, set of agricultural practices. <clears throat> but the important thing is that agriculture does have the potential to have a negative global warming potential. In other words, it can have a, agriculture could have a net positive effect on reducing greenhouse gas concentrations. Okay, so global warming potential is act, can actually be mathematically thought about in a fairly simple equation. Global warming potential equals the change in soil carbon concentration, or change in soil carbon amount, sorry, plus N2O emissions, plus methane emissions, plus energy use. And as I mentioned earlier, each of these can be converted to CO2 equivalents. I've kind of gone over this already, except that there's a new term here, the soil carbon. You can multiply that by 44 over 12 to get CO2 equivalents. And if you remember from your chemistry classes, 44 is the molecular weight of CO2, 12 is the molecular weight of carbon, and that's just the simple math. <clears throat> Energy use contributes to CO2 emissions in agriculture, so in the equation that I show, I'm going to include, I'm going to include, um, this energy piece, which sometimes in other accounting is not included in the agricultural um, column, so to speak, so that on-farm practices in production and transport of material inputs can also be converted to CO2 equivalents. And the ag engineers have done this for us in that they've provided us tables of data showing how much CO2 is emitted from a typical agricultural, from individual agricultural practices. So I'll show you a little bit more of that later. <clears throat> um, I'm going to now take you through this calculation, looking at each individual portions of this equation one at a time. So. Again, this is the same equation we saw before. Global warming equals a change in soil carbon. So an increase in soil carbon, in this case, is going to provide a negative value because you're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere if you're increasing soil carbon. So the literature shows that no till generally has more soil carbon than conventional till. However, that, that carbon that is in soil in a no-till, continuous no-till situation could be lost quickly following one tillage event. And so the carbon that is held in soil or sequestered in soil is not, it's not there forever 
depending on how you manage. So it's a, it can be resistant to decomposition, but it can also decompose, especially following tillage. I am going to talk today about organic systems, organic management systems, because they provide a, uh, uh, a window on a very different type of cropping systems than what is uh, generally found across the landscape. And because the inputs are quite different, it provides us an example of a um, of the breadth of potential agricultural management that's possible. There's very little data on organic systems, largely because there hasn't been that much research done on organic systems. And doing this kind of calculation, this global warming potential type calculation, really requires long-term uh, field studies because this soil carbon changes slowly and it changes slowly against a large background so often you don't see the change you can't measure the change until about five years down the line and then soil carbon can then increase for up to 40 years or even more so to get a real measure of what's actually happening in the real world you need long-term research projects going 20 years or more there's not that many of those studies, and so therefore there's not that much data on, on, on this type of information. That's just my little visual of, of soil organic matter. You probably all know that soil organic matter is what lends the black color to soil. Okay, so what's our next term is N2O emissions or N2O flux. And one thing that's important to think about here, remember that N2O, one molecule of N2O is essentially worth 298 molecules of CO2. So if you do some kind of management that increases soil carbon by 298 grams of CO2, but in so doing, you also release one gram of N2O, you basically haven't done anything in terms of uh, affecting climate change because the the CO2 the carbon gained in the soil is equal to the one gram of N2O that's lost. <clears throat> the literature in general shows that no-till has more or similar N2O emissions than conventional tillage. And I should mention here that we do have pretty good data on no-till and conventional till because there are a fair number of long-term studies comparing these two systems. When no-till was established in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, a number of studies were established to look at the long-term effect of no-till. It was very quite a radical departure from traditional management in agriculture, and, and researchers were very curious as to what the impacts on a number of things might be. Soil carbon might not have been at the top of their list of what they were looking at, but when they looked at baseline uh, carbon in their soils, they noticed that no-till did increase uh, carbon in the soil in a lot of situations. However, there's, uh, but let me step back a bit. We're talking about N2O here, and there are, because there's these long-term studies on no-till versus conventional till, there's also more data on N2O emissions from these, this type of comparison than a lot of other comparisons. However, there's very few data on soil N2O emissions from cropping systems in the southeast U.S. Maryland's in the southeast. That's why I have that listed here. And since we're going to be looking at organic systems in addition to no-till and conventional till, I also mentioned that there's not many data on organic systems. Okay, now next term in our equation is methane flux. Uh, most studies report no cropping system impacts for upland cropping systems. So in other words, the, the fluxes are not only small, but there's really no impact of management. So what that, what that means is we can get rid of that, this term from the equation, and we can simpl simplify our equation. So now we just have global warming potential equals change in soil carbon plus nitrous oxide flux or emissions plus energy use. Okay, I still have the methane flux here, but same equation. Let's look at energy use. In general, no-till uses less energy than chisel till. There's, quite, there's, there's no tillage in no-till, obviously, so that is a, an important source of energy use on farm. 
Herbicides are also a source of energy use, but they, the amount of energy used to produce and transport herbicides is quite a bit less than the amount of tillage that's used in conventional tillage. <clears throat> if we look at organic systems, again, they provide a, a nice end point or a, a, a very different type of system. In this case, they have no synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use. It turns out that nitrogen fertilizers or fertilizers in general are about 30 percent of energy use in agriculture in the US. That includes nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium essentially, but the bulk of that number is nitrogen. Nitrogen is very expensive energy-wise to make, and so that becomes an important source of energy use on farm. And in organic systems, there's essentially no pesticides, so there's no energy use that way. However, there is more tillage than in most conventional systems, and so that will likely be a source of more of uh, greater energy use. However, the balance of these three sources of energy generally leads to organic having less energy use than conventional tillage. There's very few comparisons between no-till and organic, and so uh, I'll just leave, you at, leave that at that, and I'll now segue to the study I'm going to talk to you about to give you a case study of this type of uh, calculation. And the goal here, which I maybe didn't mention at the very front end, is to give you information to think about uh, the impact of agriculture on climate change. The case study I'm going to show you does include uh, no-till, conventional till, and organic systems. A caveat that I'm going to mention up front is that the specific management practices used in all three of these systems can vary widely. Different people use different crop rotations in no-till, different combinations of herbicides, different types of tillage in conventional tillage, different crop rotations in organic, different amounts of use of manure or legumes. All those things will impact the results of this type of analysis. So I just want to point out that this is a case study it is not meant to make generalizable comments about these three management systems. It's more of an exercise to show you how these types of calculations are done and therefore how agricultural management impacts climate change. And, and I'm using these three systems because it shows quite a diversity of potential management practices. So this is the Long-Term Farming Systems Project, which is in Beltsville, Maryland. It was started in 1996. We have long skinny plots that are 30 feet wide and 363 feet long. So each one of these plots is um, one quarter of an acre. We use full-size farming equipment. And for every crop rotation that we have here, if we have a corn, soybean, wheat rotation, we have every rotation entry point every year. So let's say this was a three-year rotation, these three strips. This would be corn one year, soybeans, and wheat one, you know, all in the same year. And then the following year, this would be corn, this would be soybeans, and this would be wheat. So what that allows us to do is uh, have every crop present under all weather circumstances, which becomes important in these kinds of comparisons. A quick overview of the five cropping systems that we have at the Farming Systems Project. We have two conventional systems, a no-till and a chisel till or conventional till. And we have three different organic systems. We have a two-year rotation, a three-year rotation, and a six-year rotation among the organic systems. The two conventional systems are three-year rotations. And so what I'm going to focus on today then is comparing the three three-year rotations, the no-till, the chisel till, and the organic three-year rotation. All of these are corn, followed by a rye cover crop, followed by soybeans, followed by wheat, a winter wheat. In our conventional systems, we follow that with a double crop soybeans. And in our three-year organic system, we follow that with a hairy vetch cover crop, which provides the nitrogen for the following corn crop. In our conventional systems, we use sidress nitrogen fertilizer band injected into the no-till and chisel till. So we're really using best management practices in, the, in these two conventional systems. 
in terms of nitrogen management. In the organic systems, we're using a moldboard plow, and we're also using poultry litter for the corn and the wheat in the rotation to provide additional nitrogen that the legumes do not provide. So what we're trying to do is mimic what farmers do across the landscape in, in these systems. And I've already mentioned that all rotation entry points are present every year. Uh, just a reminder, I'm just going to be talking about these three systems. I'm not I'm only one of our organic systems. I'm going to show you a little bit about how people go about doing these things. Remember that global warming potential now has three components, change in soil carbon, nitrous oxide emissions, and energy use. So to look at the first portion of that, we need to measure soil carbon. And we did this in 2006 using a uh, a pickup truck mounted deep soil core that we pushed into the ground to get these uh, one meter long soil cores. You can see that we've got some nice orange soils here. And then we cut those those uh, cores into these different depth increments. In inches, this would be zero to one inch, one to two inches, uh, two to four inches, four to eight inches, eight to 16 inches and 16 inches to uh, about 40 inches. I'm sorry, uh, I got that wrong. Uh, 0 to 1, 1 to 2 inches, 2 to 4 inches, 4 to 10 inches, 10 to 20 inches, 20 to 40 inches. We cut those up into those different depth increments and then we process the soils and we basically burn the soil and measure the CO2 that comes off and that CO2 that came off used to be the carbon in the soil, so that's kind of the opposite process that we're looking to do in carbon sequestration, and then you can measure that CO2. For measuring nitrous oxide fluxes, that's a little more complicated. Remember that we measured our chisel till, our no-till, and our three-year organic. It's maybe hard to see here, but in here we have these frames that we keep in the field all year long. We have to remove them for uh, tillage operations, obviously. And those frames then define a certain area that we will sample, and we sample that by putting this lid on top of the frame, and we fill a little gutter here with water, which keeps it uh, sealed, uh, gas uh, sealed to the atmosphere. Uh, handy, we use a we use handy dandy grad students in this case who has, you might not be able to see it there, but if you look closer on this slide, you see he's holding a syringe and needle and he's sampling this headspace of this chamber. And he's putting that sample into a little gas vial. We bring that back to the lab, measure it on a gas chromatograph. And we sample, in this case, four samples within 12 to 21 minutes so that then we can see the increase in the gas over time, and it's the slope of this line that we're interested in getting, is how quickly N2O is coming out of the soil. Okay, that's how we measure nitrous oxide flux. Uh, we need to do this not just once, but many times over the year, and we've done it actually up to 40 times, that's 22 to 34 times per year here. And you need to do it many times to capture the temporal variability of N2O emissions, which are very dynamic. Okay, for energy use, this is just showing an example for corn in one of our years, 2008, and just looking at the machinery component of energy use. These are all the different types of operations that we use in these three systems. And by looking at the engineering literature, we get these CE values, carbon equivalent values. So it's kilograms of carbon equivalents per hectare per pass of that field piece of equipment. So you see here that moldboard plow takes a lot more energy to use than a chisel plow. That makes sense. A disc uses even less. And then like a field cultivator uses less energy on down. Side dress N application requires more energy because you're breaking the soil and you have the friction of the implement going through the soil. So what we did is we basically looked at all our operations, 
figured out how many times we did those operations in the various three systems, multiplied these numbers by these numbers, and then added those numbers to get at the amount of energy used for machinery in this case for these three systems. So you'll see that our machinery use number for uh, no-till is quite a bit lower than for chisel-till, which makes sense, and it's less than for the three-year organic, and that also makes sense just because you see that we do have more uh, tillage operations here. Okay, so that's for the machinery component of energy use. Just to give you an example, okay, so now we've done all three of those things and we are going to add up those numbers, and so that's where we can segue to the results. This uh, diagram shows the same uh, research field showing that we do have some topography out there. So our soil carbon numbers then, when we look at our three different systems, no-till, chisel, till, and organic, this is the amount of carbon to one meter soil depth, so about three feet. And these units are in megagrams of carbon per hectare. Don't worry about that so much. Focus more on the fact that there's differences in our three systems. The literature, as I noted, generally shows that no-till has more carbon than a conventional till system. While we see that the average is higher, the st there's no statistical difference in our case between these two systems. So we haven't built up any carbon in our no-till system in the 11 years between 1996 when the experiment was started and 2006 when the samples were taken. However, if we look at our organic system, you notice that the value is bigger and that this little a indicates that it, this number is statistically different from the two numbers above, which have b's after them. And so it turns out we actually have more carbon in our soil in the organic system than in the two conventional systems. So what we're interested in, though, is the change in soil carbon, right? Remember the equation has change in soil carbon, it's just not the amount of carbon. So what I did, since we didn't have numbers for 1996 when the experiment was started, what I did know, though, is that for at least 11 years prior to the establishment of these plots, the entire field had been in a no-till situation, had been no-till corn and or alfalfa. So I made the assumption that the change in soil carbon in the no-till system was zero. Because the no, because it had been in no-till prior to that, and I assumed that the um, the situation had equilibrated. Now you can ask questions about that later, whether that's a good assumption or not. I'd be happy to entertain those questions. But what's important to know is that in doing that calculation, the difference between these three figures, the absolute differences between these three numbers, is not going to change based on that assumption. And so what this tells us then is that there's no change in soil carbon in no-till, right? That's zero change. But in the chisel-till system, there's a negative change. So in other words, a decrease in soil carbon compared to 1996, the assumption of 1996. In the organic system, on, by, by, uh, by contrast, there's an increase in soil carbon. And that increase is substantially greater than zero which is our no-till system. Okay, so that's our first portion of the GWP equation is change in soil carbon. If we look more closely at change in soil, at the soil carbon though, we do see an interesting picture. Now in this graph, this is the depth, the midpoint of our samples that I showed you that we took out of the, down to a meter. And I've put the depth in inches over here for your, uh, to make it easier to kind of look at that. If you look at the zero, and this is the amount of, to of total soil carbon across this uh, axis here, this might be a different way of looking at data than you're used to, but if you think of this as the surface of the soil and this as going down into the soil, that's kind of the way I like to present this because it kind of works with the way I think. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to you. If you see in the top two inches here, the no-till does have quite a bit more carbon than the conventional till or than the organic, and that's not too surprising in that um, in that we're building up carbon at the surface 
And why is that? That's because that's where the carbon's being placed in that all the plant residue is being put, is, is falling down on the soil surface. Most of the roots are at that surface, so when they die, they accumulate carbon at the soil surface. That has a lot of benefits in terms of reducing erosion, increasing water infiltration, but as we go down deep, deeper into the soil, you don't have to go very deep, two to four inches, and you see that no-till has no impact compared to chisel till. These two numbers are probably not different statistically, and as you keep going down, if you compare the blue and the green lines, there's no difference between the chisel till and no-till. Now, what's interesting, what was interesting to me, I, I assume that the organic would have about, would be, uh, I assume that the no-till would have more total carbon than the chisel till and that the organic would be intermediate. And that is the case at the soil surface, and we are po possibly putting more carbon into the soil in the organic systems, but if you look down deep at 2 to 4 inches and 4 to 10 inches, there's more carbon in the organic systems than even in the no-till system. So why is that? How could that be? We're tilling more in this system than we do in the other systems, and we know that tillage reduces soil carbon, but here's the system that we do the most tillage in, but it has the most carbon. Well, that carbon is largely being placed at 2 to 10 inches, and it's staying there despite all this tillage. So what that tells me is that that the, with the carbon is staying where we're putting it, right? Even down down to 10 to 20 inches, we're not really seeing any statistical differences between these three systems, but we're definitely seeing this big bulge of carbon in the organic systems that was unexpected. Okay, so that's the uh, that was kind of a side a side note on the on the change in soil carbon. Piece. Let's look at the nitrous oxide then. This is just for corn, so it's not the full rotation, but I'm just showing it for, as an example. Here's our three cropping systems. Here's the years that we measured the nitrous oxide, and here's the statistical significance of the differences for in a given year. And you'll see that for many years, for three out of the five years that we measured, we see no difference in N2O emissions during the corn phase of the rotation. For two of the years, we do see differences, but in one of those years, the organic has a lower N2O emissions than the two conventional, and the other year, the organic has uh, higher N2O emissions than the two conventional, but, but not much, and, and it's actually not even statistically more than in the no-till. So the point of this is that N2O emissions can be quite variable from one year to another, which is another reason that it's important to have long-term data. And then when we add these numbers for the three years, we actually see that there's a slightly higher N2O emissions in the no-till than in the organic. But that's not a huge difference, but it is statistically significant. I'm going to uh, not talk about this last column for now. Uh, I'm going to skip that comment for now, too. That kind of goes beyond the scope of what I really want to discuss today. Remember that last slide, then, was just for corn, and now we're looking at the whole system. We're looking at the corn, the soybean, and the wheat, and we, but we're doing it just for 2008 as, a, as an example. We've got our three systems, our statistical significance down here, and you'll see that we had no differences in 2008 among the three systems, no differences in the soybean portion of the rotation. But look at this, wow, during the wheat portion of the rotation, a huge difference in that organic had a lot more N2O emissions than the conventional systems did. So that when we add up for the full rotation for these three systems for this year, we see that the organic system has a lot more N2O emissions than the no-till, and while it looks like it has more than the chisel till, that wasn't statistically significant. But the point of, one of the points I want to make in all this is that it can be, can get kind of complicated and that you need lots of years of data and you need to measure these things quite often. Another point I want to make is that this is interesting to me. Why would there be so much N2O emissions from the wheat portion of the rotation? If you remember from the earlier slide, I showed what the crop rotation is. 
And following wheat, we have double crop soybeans in these conventional systems. In the organic system, we have about six to eight weeks where the soil is bare and the soil moisture gets high, whereas here the soybeans are pulling the moisture out of the soil during the summer. Here the moisture can accumulate, and it turns out N2O is emitted generally at a higher rate under wetter soil conditions. Not only do we have wet soil conditions, but we have a soil that we've improved substantially in terms of its fertility, so we actually have more nitrogen availability. So that combination of high nitrogen availability and a wet soil is really what in general leads to higher N2O emissions. So we're kind of seeing a, a, a kind of a hole in our rotation here where this particular organic management rotation is, is providing an opportunity for N2O emissions. And uh, that's something to, to think about. Okay, so let's this, remember we have three terms in our GWP equation. This is the third term now, energy use. And I'm just showing an example here for corn only. And we looked at the machinery inputs before. And so uh, so we looked at machinery inputs before. What we didn't look at is nutrients. We didn't look at seeds or herbicides. This shows all of those inputs. These are the uh, major uh, uses of energy on farm or not only on farm but also uh, in the nutrients, in the herbicides. There's also the uh, production and transport of these of these inputs included in these values. So you come over here and you see these enormous values here in the conventional systems, and that's because nitrogen is expensive energetically to produce. So th those numbers become quite large. When we add everything up then, our energy use in our conventional systems for the corn phase of the rotation that uses a lot of nitrogen fertilizer is quite a bit higher than for our organic system. Now the, now the nutrients portion of the organic, one important piece of that is that um, we're using poultry litter in that system. The transport distance of the poultry litter is going to impact this number quite a bit. And what we assumed is that we are not transporting our poultry litter more than a few miles, essentially. And so that value is fairly small. On the eastern shore of Maryland, a lot of times poultry litter is not transported very far, but sometimes it is. So that number could be tweaked based on transport distance. So, Okay, so this is energy use. This is the corn. Uh, and I had gone forward to look at the full rotation. So now remember we have corn, soybean, wheat rotations. So now we're looking at the full rotation down here. And you'll notice that we still have more energy use in our conventional systems than in our organic system. And again, a lot of it is driven by the corn phase of the rotation where we have a fair amount of nitrogen use. There's very few, diff there's many, many fewer differences in the soybean portion of the rotation. But then again, in wheat, a high, another high nitrogen demanding crop, we get this substantial difference in energy use between the three systems. So it's really the nitrogen use in the conventional systems that drives differences in energy use among the three systems. So now we're on the one of the final slides. We're adding this all up. Remember, this is the equation. Change in soil carbon plus N2O plus energy equals global warming potential, right? Here's our three systems. We talked about each of these numbers in a uh, stepwise fashion. This is the change in soil carbon. This is the N2O. I might not have shown that number before, but you'll notice that there's actually more N2O emissions in the organic system than there is in the no-till system. And it's kind of a trade-off with this energy. There's more energy use in the conventional systems and less N2O emissions. These two kind of are a wash in that we have low N2O in the conventional but high energy use, and vice versa, high N2O in the organic but low energy use. So what really drives these differences among in global warming potential here is really the change in soil carbon. We saw a decrease in soil carbon for the chisel till system, and now that gives us a positive value because that basically says that we're emitting CO2 into the atmosphere in that system. For the no-till, we're assuming it's, a, it's a, at a stable equilibrium, so we're not accumulating, but we're not releasing. But in the organic system, we have a negative value because this, that says that 
the soil is absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. That's, that's a bit of a loose language there. The soil is accumulating carbon largely through photosynthesis, but also remember we're adding poultry litter in this system. And uh, this, you could definitely ask questions about how the accounting is done on that. We could discuss that afterwards. But in, the, in, the, in essence, what happens when you add all these things up is that we still have a negative impact of this organic management compared to a positive impact on global warming potential for two conventional systems with a chisel till having substantially more global warming potential than the no-till system. So that is the type, a type of analysis that's not done too often because of the lack of long-term data sets that we were able to pull together. And that shows a couple things. One, uh, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, let me leave it at that for now because I'm segueing to factoring in the crop yield in these systems. And I'm going to show you one graph here that shows that our average corn yields, average corn yields for our five systems, and remember we're focusing on no-till, the chisel till, and the three-year organic, and you'll notice that the corn yields over the years have been higher in our conventional than in our organic. So we really need to think about that in terms of global warming potential relative to crop yield. And so what I did on this next slide, these are the same numbers we saw before. And I looked at crop yield, and this is across the whole rotation. So these numbers kind of have an odd meaning. We're combining corn, soybean, and wheat uh, grain yields. And we have lower yields in the, in the organic than the conventional, so we have to divide these numbers by those numbers to get what we call greenhouse gas intensity. So how much CO2 equivalents we produce per unit of grain produced. And this really doesn't change the numbers that much because our yield in our two conventional systems is very similar. So now we still have uh, more um, CO2 emissions in the chisel till than the no-till, but it turns out they're not statistically significant anymore. But because our, our, our organic had a negative global warming potential, it still has a negative global warming potential. It's just that the difference, though, between these two numbers isn't going to be as great. So the conclusions from this, um, let me get my uh, pointer back. I don't know where it went. Oh, there he is. So conclusions from this exercise or that in this case for the specific management used in these organic systems compared to the specific management used in our two conventional systems, we found more soil carbon in the organic system than the two conventional systems. But what was interesting is that the carbon is sequestered at depth in the organic systems. This is going to be more stable carbon than the surface than the carbon in the surface soils of no-till. And we know this because of studies that show that tillage of a no-till system can reduce that surface soil carbon substantially. And we know that the carbon in the organic systems is stable because we're tilling these systems every year, yet the carbon is staying there. So one conclusion is that we need to include diverse cropping systems and long-term agricultural research studies to fully evaluate soil carbon sequestration options. If we had not had this organic system in, these, in this comparison, what we would have found is that no-till and chisel-till don't have a lot of difference, and we wouldn't have seen what this potential carbon sequestration with uh, essentially burying your carbon inputs might be. Uh, this uh, grace net is listed here because there's a number of studies that ARS is uh, is doing across the country in a network to, to do these types of analyses and this project is just one of about 30 projects to, to look at this type of analysis. Uh, there's the soil carbon coming back. Uh, conclusions from the N2O flux data is that manure application contributed to high N2O flux in our organic system. This was especially notable in 2008, the data I showed you. And we probably could use more data for N2O flux since it is so variable from year to year. Conclusions on energy use, and these are these are these these are. This is a good. Uh, this is a robust conclusion that 
conventional systems really use quite a bit more energy than organic systems, and that's largely because of the nitrogen uh, fertilizer, the, the energy cost of nitrogen fertilizer. However, one caveat, in these organic systems, if you transport manure uh, a longer distance than we did in our assumptions, you're going to increase energy use, and that's something to keep in mind in terms of manure use. Um, kind of, I believe this is my last slide, global warming potential then was greater in the conventional till than the no-till, and it was greater in the no-till than the three-year organic. And the three-year organic actually showed a negative global warming potential, showing an example of how we might be able to sequester carbon by burying it deep inside the soil, whether it's organic or not. That's the point I want to make, is that these results are not necessarily because the system is organic, but it's because we're burying the carbon. When we looked at the globe, uh, greenhouse gas intensity uh, by collecting for crop yield, we see that the two conventional systems are the same, and they had a higher intensity than the three-year organic. All these differences were driven primarily by soil carbon, secondarily by energy use, and the point I want to make here, the, the point of this exercise is really to try to instill this point here that how we grow crops can impact the global warming potential of agriculture. These are just three systems. You can think of many other permutations that might increase uh, carbon sequestration or decrease N2O emissions, but this is the kind of math that needs to be done to really look at the full effect of, of cropping systems on uh, greenhouse gas production. And we have mitigation options that can be implemented today, whether it's no-till, which has been shown in other cases to increase carbon sequestration, or whether it's uh, more complex rotations or other management practices. Um, I kind of said all this already, but each component of global warming potential can be targeted to reduce climate change impacts. We can target change in soil carbon, we can target N2O flux, or we can target energy use. And the data here and elsewhere show that the primary impact is often through a change in soil carbon, but you might be able to envision systems where you might be able to get a better a bigger bang for your buck, so to speak, with reducing N2O flux or maybe reducing energy flux, uh, energy use. Um, N2O provides mitigation compared to chisel till in, due to soil carbon sequestration based on literature values more than this particular study, but burying carbon may provide even more carbon sequestration potential than no-till. And then finally, reducing end fertilizer inputs may have a bigger mitigating impact via reduction in CO2 emitted during production and transport than the actual N2O emitted in the soil from the fertilizer. I guess I have too many conclusion slides here. I'm going to stop there, um, and I say I don't have too much time, so I'll see if I can take any questions if, if we have time for that. <laughs>